So welcome everybody. Um, we have an excellent agenda here today. Um, we are asking everybody to chat in their name and the organization um, in the chat box. And as always, we welcome everybody to ask questions during the presentation. We're gonna go over the agenda here in a few minutes on who, who and what we have uh, in terms of presentations for today. Please add your questions in for the speakers into the chat box and there will be um, an answer portion of each major um, presentation for today. You are welcome to answer anybody else's questions if you have answers for them in the chat box as well. So we, we do encourage that. Also for our speakers, we are encouraging um, speakers to pause occasionally to facilitate dialogue during the discussion portions of the presentations. Um, and our meeting facilitator for today is gonna be Alana. And we wanna remind everybody that our meeting will be recorded today. Thank you for coming. Lana, could you move to the next slide? Okay. Um, so what we have going on today are, I'm just gonna introduce everybody first. We're gonna start with introductions. And then we are going to hear from um, Sahara from the NC NCACH about funding opportunities. And um, we're also gonna be hearing about FIRE uh, from Chris, uh, Ray, and Liz Walker, and Carleen Anders. And we'll be receiving some uh, communications updates from Peter Morgan, and we'll also be hearing about um, COVID-19 cases and why we're seeing an increase and try to do some solutions thinking. And we have Jimmy Wallace, Alan Fisher, Scott Graham and Chris Branch and Andy Hover and Lori Jones speaking um, on that topic today. So for our introductions, um, we have our speakers, of course. We also have Marsha from North Valley Hospital, Melody White from Family Health Centers, uh, Lindsay Cox from Family Health Centers, the Opioid Treatment Network, Scott Graham, the CEO of Three Rivers Hospital, Laura Brumfield, Liz Walker from Clean Air Met Howe, Kathleen Manzo from Family Health Centers, Caitlin from Room One, Caitlin Cordell, uh, Jasmine Minbashian from Methow Valley Citizens Council, Brooke Lukensmeyer from Room One, Donnie Guerrero from Molina Healthcare, Marcy Stamper from Methow Valley News, Alan Fisher, the CEO of Mid Valley Hospital, uh, Liz Walker from Clean Air Methow, Stacey Auckland from Okanagan County Community Coalition, Annie Coughlin from uh, a volunteer contact tracer for public health, Shannon Mendoza, Bright Start Services, Birth to Threes, Early Intervention Services, Andrea Carpenter from Upstream and Partner with Family Health Centers, Betsy Weist from MetHow at Home and a contact tracer as well, Jim Wallace from Family Health Centers, Sahara Suval from NCACH, Mary Hinger from WorkSource Okanagan County, Karen Shimp, community member of Tenasket, North Valley Hospital and, Chai, and part of the Chai Leadership Council. Josh Thompson from Okanagan County Public Works Director and County Engineer. Jesus Hernandez from Family Health Centers. Drew Katz from Methow Valley Citizens Council. Jessica Dominguez from Upstream. Rachel Levi. Kelsey Gust from Action Health Powner, uh, Partners and from the Chelan Douglas Chai. Cindy Button from Arrow Methow Rescue Service, Carleen Anders from Okanagan County Long-Term Recovery Group, Chris Ray, Air Quality Program Manager from the Confederated Tribes of the Cabo Reservation, Crystal Eshelman from Public Health, Kelly Edwards from Room One, Michelle Gaines, uh, Winthrop Clerk and Treasurer, Molly Morris from Cooley Medical Center, Peter Morgan, part of the Chai Leadership Council and member of the Board for Family Health Centers, De La Culp from WorkSource in Okanagan County, Chris Branch, Okanagan County Commissioner, Lisa Forer from HCS in Alta, Kelly Edwards from Room One, uh, and Christine Gaffney, um, part of our general membership, general public. 
and I think I got everybody, I hope. Um, if anybody is uh, joining us now, please introduce yourself in the chat box and um, I'm gonna pass it on to Alana. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so you all will notice the format is a little different this time. We're approaching this because we have such great, uh, we have a panelist, we thought we would try and set up a webinar version rather than our typical Zoom meeting. And we'll get your feedback to see what feels like a better fit for this particular discussion. And all that to say, um, Michelle and I are very new to this, so there will be mistakes. You can count on it, but we will certainly um, have lots and lots of great content in here, but it may be, we're, we're still working our way through figuring out how to do this. Um, so thank you for your patience. Uh, let's see. So um, before we jump in, actually, I am going to have Sahara join us as a panelist and have her uh, share a little update with you all about what's going on with NCACH. And then Sahara, as soon as you are done, which will just give you a couple minutes, um, we're going to drop into some new data on COVID-19 and pick up with our panelists for to talk about fire. Um, Sarah, go ahead. We should be ready. Wonderful. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, wonderful. Uh, well, hello, everybody. My name is Sahara Suval. Um, I work with the North Central Accountable Community of Health um, and also have the pleasure of getting to work uh, with the coalitions as they may need. Um, I just wanted to pop on and share a couple updates from the ACH. There are a lot of things happening, um, especially as we kind of retransition ourselves back into Medicaid transformation work. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, in March of this year, we actually um, paused our Medicaid transformation work and joined our local public health, uh, local health jurisdictions as members of the incident command team. And we're actually helping assist with COVID-19 pandemic response. We did that until June uh, and are now starting to transition back to picking up Medicaid transformation work, knowing that uh, we have till 2021 um, for the transformation to formally conclude, though we do uh, hope and anticipate that the work and the initiatives, uh, particularly done by all of you wonderful folks and our partners, will be ongoing uh, for, for many years to come. Um, so with that, though, we do have uh, a, an open funding opportunity that I'd like to, I'll pop the information into the chat, um, but for those of you who are familiar with our rapid cycle funding to address uh, the opioid use public health crisis, we do have applications open for that funding opportunity now. Um, this is a, an application that provides up to $10,000 for shovel-ready projects that are um, having to do with addressing the opioid use crisis. So we funded quite a few partners out of Okanagan County in the past, um, and there's a lot of great information on our website about that. But the application is pretty short, uh, and it is we are accepting applications through August 6th. So I will put in a link in the chat that has more information about that funding opportunity. Um, but if you know anyone or you yourself or your organization are, are interested in looking for some funding for some work to help uh, address the opioid use public health crisis, this is a really great opportunity um, and we hope to offer it uh, for years to come. So this is, this is out now, applications are closed on August 6th. So it's kind of a short turnaround. Um, and if you have any more questions, there's more information in the link that you can find about uh, how to direct questions. Um, and then the other update that I'd like to share is last year, uh, the um, ACH governing board allocated $450,000 to be invested into local and regional health projects through a community investment process that was developed uh, by an advisory group consisting of members of the Coalitions for Health Improvement. That funding opportunity launched in 2019 and we ultimately awarded eight finalists across the four county region, being Chelan, Douglas, Grant, and Okanagan counties. Um, we had intention to launch this opportunity much earlier again this year in 2020, but uh, COVID-19 did force a delay. Um, so I want to share that our regional leadership council, the Coalitions for Health Improvement Leadership Council, has been working on developing proposed uh, process recommendations to the funding opportunity, and we do actually hope to launch that soon. Um, and one of the primary updates that are being proposed and will be shared with the governing board uh, is 
the opportunity for the coalitions to be a lot more active this year in terms of managing application and review, application review, as well as um, developing finalist recommendations. So helping, helping to actually really um, identify kind of who are top, the top funded proposals or the top scoring proposals and, and recommend them for funding ultimately. So more to come with that information, but I just wanna get that on your radar so that if you have some projects buzzing, uh, this might be a good time to start thinking about that or, or starting to talk to partners. Um, and as soon as we have that information around the funding opportunity, I will get that to Michelle and Ilana uh, to get that out. So um, more exciting things to come down the line. Other than that, I will tuck the link for the opioid funding in the chat and feel free to reach out to me in chat or via email um, if you have more questions. And thanks for giving me the time here. Thanks, Sahara. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so to kick us off, we thought we might share just some brand new data um, and really welcome everyone who's here for um, these meetings, I think are growing with, with every passing month and we're learning a lot about how to structure these most effectively and just getting some really bright and, and reflective folks from across the county who are showing up. So we had Crystal Eshelman, who is some of you may know and some of you may not know, um, a regional epidemiologist. And she's working out of Okanagan County, but works across a couple different districts, um, pulled, together, pulled together a few graphs for us on COVID-19 here in Okanagan County. And I'm sharing this with you all, I think, um, or I would say with the intention of helping contextualize how important the discussion is about fire in COVID-19 and how important the second part of our webinar is, uh, which is about how we actually reduce COVID-19 cases um, here in the county. So this graph was put together by Crystal Eshelman. I'm gonna go through these very quickly and we'll pull them back up uh, towards the second half of the webinar. But here you can see just the cumulative case count for Okanagan County and clearly in since July, we have seen a major surge uh, across the county. This next slide shows incidents, incident rates. So that's total number of cases per population of 100,000 people. And I think this, this graph is particularly uh, startling, I might be the best word, um, but also really important, I think, for all of us to take note of, um, for us to understand really how important the situation here at Okanagan County is for us to respond to. So this shows incident rate by county, and you can see that Okanagan County is at the very top with 917 cases per population of 100,000 people in the last 14 days. Um, so with that, I am going to in, have our panelists come and join us. Uh, the first one who's going to be on is Chris Ray from the Colville Tribes. He'll be on in just a moment. Carleen Anders um, from Okanagan Long-Term Recovery Organization and Liz Walker who's with Clean Air Metal. Um, and all of these folks are going to start by giving you just five minutes um, in, in a five minutes response to a key question that we've asked them. So it may be about um, generally speaking, what a typical recovery looks like during COVID-19 or a typical recovery from smoke um, or a typical recovery in terms of establishing uh, returning to health, good health and well-being. And then they'll ask a second question. They'll be asked a second question, um, which is how will those typical trajectories of recovery be impacted by COVID-19 this year? I mean, we encourage you again to drop questions into the chat box and we will do our best to respond to them and encourage you all to respond to each other's as well. Um, so. Let's have Chris. Are you on, Chris? Not quite. Chris, panelist. There he is. Nice. Okay. Chris, we'll have you go first. Um, welcome. Chris, it looks like you might be muted, would be my guess. Yeah. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, awesome. Okay. Okay, are we good to go? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. So I'm Chris Ray. I'm the Air Quality Program Manager for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. And um, talk about becoming smoke ready. So we're, you know, how to prepare it, know the facts, and, and, and stay healthy. And we had a um, webinar recently with the 
Okanagan River Airshed Partnership and several federal partners on this subject, which will be posted on the uh, okcleanair.org site and also the um, air quality page on the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation site. So I've been at this for quite a long time and run lots of monitors and uh, been talking about smoke for many, many years. So th this is a just our Okanagan River Airshed Partnerships um, mission statement. Basically, it says that we're going to do uh, everything we can except regulations to um, limit our community's exposure to PM 2.5, which is a major component of smoke. And for some of the work we've, we've done in the past, we received the EPA Clean Air Act Excellence Award for Community Action in 2019, and that was um, a real, real honor. So timing of smoke in our, our communities is very important to understand. So you can see by this chart, I laid out some of the sources of smoke by the month of the year. And during the summer months, we pretty much have wildfire smoke and some industrial smoke, which is pretty limited in our community right now. But in the winter from October through April, um, we have many more sources of smoke, uh, backyard burning, residential burning, agricultural fires, some prescription fires and wood stove use. And you overlay that with our local inversions in the OMAC Okanagan area and some other places in, in the valleys, in the county, you create more smoke that everybody is exposed to. So this, this is a chart put together by uh, Raniel uh, from the Department of Ecology and used on our last webinar, comparing Okanagan County air quality for the last nine wildfire seasons. And you can see that um, about half of them we are uh, affected adverse, greatly adversely by wildfire smoke in our communities. You can look at uh, 2015 for OMAC, um, it was pretty bad. 2018 for TWIST, of course, was really bad up there. Um, so that just means that we, we can expect smoke in our lives and we really have to prepare for that. And you can see the colors uh, there correspond to the air quality index through EPA. And you can look that up to see what those mean. But the, when you get to hazardous or very unhealthy, which we all, all experienced in 2018, then you know you have to do something to protect your health. So I've also measured indoor air quality in buildings in 2015. Uh, this is in Nespelum. And when you get up into the uh, concentrations of micrograms per cubic meter that are shown on here, that's all very hazardous. And the outside concentration is 980, which is um, almost to the point where all the monitors shut down because it's, it's too high. I can't measure any higher than that. So this also points out the fact that we have wildfire outside at high concentrations, but it's still inside at high concentrations. And once you peak Hazard starts at 250 micrograms per cubic meter. And once you go past that, uh, it's all hazardous. But there's generally degrees of, of worse there, I guess. So this also shows some of the uh, smoke that we get in our lives on non-wildfire season. This is also done by the Department of Ecology. November through February, which is considered the uh, heating season uh, for wood stove use and also the backyard burning season. So we also get a fair amount of smoke in our lives during that uh, time, especially it's tied to the hour of the day when people start heating their homes in the, in the morning and then uh, in the afternoon too. So you can see that from uh, what three or four o'clock in the afternoon through uh, eight o'clock in the morning, might be smoke in our airs too. And that, that ties directly to the inversion layer I mentioned earlier. So why become smoke ready? This is a, a concept that I think we all have to embrace and uh, look at. We want to especially increase our awareness of smoke. A lot of people, we you know, grew up here, we're, we're used to smoke in the summers, but we've progressed into a, a different realm of smoke. We didn't used to get wildfire smoke into the hazardous zone for any length of time. Now we may be above unhealthy or very unhealthy for uh, half a month or more at a time. So we want to prepare for this year's season and future seasons. Um, smoke is really complex and the sources of smoke is complex and how those sources affect us. 
And then we want to get our strategies together to minimize our community's exposure to this smoke. And, that, and that's the hard part. And that's um, each community is different and those strategies to minimize smoke will be different per community. So here's some resources that um, local resources, the web page for the Cobble Tribes um, Air Quality Program. We also have a Facebook page that we post quite often on. And the Okanagan River Airshed Partnership, uh, okclean.air.org. have a Facebook page and a Twitter account on those too. So if you could uh, take a look at those, the webinar that we did last week on creating a smoke ready community is posted on each of those pages um, soon. I'm still working on that. And uh, also the PDFs of all the slides will be there too. So, yep, thank you for allowing me to uh, speak on this subject, and uh, it's an interesting group to be participating in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That was very, just great timing, too. Um, let's pass this over to Liz Walker next. So, Liz is answering the question of, were the primary impacts of fire on health and key components of recovering our health and well-being in a typical year? Thanks, Alana. Screen up here for us. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great. And here we go. Slides as well. Um, so thanks, Chris, so much for that great lead in. Um, Alana, I'll acknowledge that um, I'm typically giving a presentation that is within the scope of what Chris just talked about, much more focused on clean air and the impacts of smoke on health and well-being. Um, Alana asked me to expand a little more broadly and talk about the impacts of wildfire more generally. Um, and I'm grateful for Chris's lead in because I'm just skipping the bit about, um, I appreciate that all of us who live here in Okanagan County understand, especially through the last several years, um, how, uh, how great the problem is. And I think it's um, really phenomenal that we're talking about what is going to be potentially even um, exacerbating and more difficult to deal with this year while we have the COVID-19 pandemic ongoing. So um, I answered this question that Alana gave me quite directly. So the first part of it was, what are the primary impacts of fire on health and well-being? Um, and so the first one is maybe perhaps the most obvious that we think about, which would be the physical impacts of wildfire flames and certainly smoke, which includes irritant effects, but also much more serious um, pulmonary, cardiovascular, neurological, developmental. Um, the list just goes on and on as the research increases. Looking at the effects of PM 2.5, we're discovering more and more systems that are impacted by exposure, um, compounded by the fact that we have globally increasing exposures to this pollutant. The other huge part of, um, of an impact on health from fire is really our mental health and well-being. This includes everything from depression, anxiety, stress, hypervigilance once the fire and smoke have passed, um, as well as PTSD. And anecdotally speaking with many of you and other healthcare providers in our community, we've heard that especially during these prolonged smoke episodes or during wildfire, Providers often see far more visits for people coming in to manage their anxiety and stress than they do for things like exacerbation of pulmonary conditions. So this is a really, really big and I think still underappreciated um, health impact. I also wanted to just um, acknowledge that all of the social determinants of health really, when we think about health comprehensively are impacted by fire and smoke as well. And so, um, so I've listed just a few here. And these are pretty easy to link to how these things um, all become more challenging when we have uh, wildfire. And the last one, I'm not gonna touch on it all, but especially when there are a lot of structures destroyed or large areas, there are issues potentially on health that result from water and soil pollution. There's a great article I just wanted to draw our attention to um, titled, Wildfire Recovery is a Hot Moment for Creating Fire Adapted Communities. Uh, in the International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and one of the, you know, I think, again, I feel like I'm likely preaching to the choir because I think our community has done a really great job in thinking about recovery um, and long-term recovery organization that, um, that really a few different things here. 
um, while we have people's attention, we really need to start to think about rebuilding systems that reduce our vulnerability. So post wildfire, of course, there are rebuilding efforts that are necessary if we think about things like lost structures, um, but we really need to address root causes of risk and vulnerability within our community. And I think you know, we can define vulnerability as our susceptibility to harm or loss. This ties directly into what Chris just talked about in, in building a smoke ready community. Um, and I also, the first bullet point here, I think is one that we all appreciate the complexity of this issue is that welfare impacts, including those on health, are really a coupled human ecological um, problem. And that this interconnectedness makes welfare risk reducing welfare risk, um, really the responsibility of lots and lots of different people and needs lots and lots of expertise to do it effectively. So um, the, the second part of the question was, what do recovery efforts to address health impacts of wildfire and smoke look like in a typical year, a year when we don't have a, a pandemic going on? And again, despite, I think, a ton of efforts and notwithstanding the efforts of lots of folks on this call and many organizations in our community, um, when we think about whether we are doing enough to address the mental health impacts of, of fire and smoke, um, when we think about are we truly a smoke ready community, um, I think we have to uh, um, acknowledge that the answer is no. And so similarly, um, I'll just touch on this, although I'm bleeding a little bit, I think into, well, the second bit is um, about COVID specifically, but um, the recovery solutions to these health impacts that I just outlined um, are many of them in progress right now. And I wanna just define them and acknowledge that um, we really need to continue building um, these efforts. So the first Chris touched on building a smoke ready community. I think he's gonna have a chance to talk about that a little bit more. Increasing access to mental health services. Um, this includes funding programs for free and low cost care, promoting our existing services that we have either here locally or even nationally. Reducing the stigma of mental health care is obviously a, a huge, huge um, endeavor, but one that I think is really important, um, as well as using our existing services and use those to proactively reach those at risk. Um, I had that I was actually in the clinic of family health this year for uh, COVID and um, was given depression and anxiety screening. And I think that um, if we acknowledge that wildfire similar to the conditions that people are experiencing right now because of the pandemic and begin to consider this as potentially standard of care could go a really long way um, to, to improving um, the ability for folks to understand the importance and be aware of um, that it's normal to experience this level of stress. Um, I just say we have, we're just, we're just fine. Kind of awesome. That's fine. Alana, I can wrap it there and wrap my other comments in, or I have one other that I maybe would just highlight here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So um, we'll make these available after the fact, because I think they're really important. But there are lots of other examples where um, folks have really recognized the importance of mental health resiliency in response to fire, fire um, wildfire. And, you know, we're both similar and also unique with regards to our county and our particular demographics and sort of the rural nature of our um, community. So these are some of the things that with regards to an outreach campaign that have been previously identified by lots of folks working on this topic in terms of um, destigmatizing and normalizing how stressful it is. So um, teaching stress reduction techniques, building awareness and normalizing mental health impacts of fire and smoke, creating spaces and time for people to come together, um, emphasizing the importance of social connections and support systems. We know that's a huge one that we've seen has been incredibly helpful as people reach out to one another through our welfare disasters. And then finally, reducing a sense of hopelessness and helplessness by building self-sufficiency. And this again can really be through things like um, both education, um, improving access to information about air quality and smoke, as well as giving people tools to improve their indoor air quality, making sure that everyone has the ability to have uh, air purifiers or access to clean indoor air space during smoke episodes. So Alana, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, let's have Carlene pop on. Liz, if you wanna drop out of that share screen real quick, we'll have Carlene come in there. Nice. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, 
Carlene, we will have you go, we'll pass the microphone over to you. Hey, thank you, Alana. Uh, let me just make sure. Okay, so uh, I was asked to talk about the key components of effective long-term recovery. And really, um, long-term recovery is really about people. And it's going to be a huge challenge because uh, for recovery efforts, if we, as we go through that, uh, because it is so human, it's so close, and everything that we do uh, that really provided the most support after the 2014 and 15 fires was about people being on site, people being together, uh, volunteers coming to help, uh, those kind of things. So um, that is one of the things to really remember in this. Uh, secondly, long-term recovery is long-term and it can't be rushed. And so a lot of people would come into town and say, where was the fire? And, and are y'all all good now back to normal? Well, we never get back to normal exactly in a major disaster. And so uh, long-term recovery has long-term impacts. And uh, so um, in terms of being most effective, uh, it's really important that there's overlaps in communication and networking between all recovery resources and support systems. And we've done a good job here, like Liz said, in this county for doing some of those overlaps. Uh, we do have some, some things that were dropped and missed, but uh, uh, it's pretty critical for people to recover and end up with resiliency. So, um, and then survivors who participate directly in their own recovery are empowered. And that is a critical piece to, uh, to any long-term recovery. Also, uh, it is holistic and personalized. And so everyone has a different recovery plan, a different idea how they recover in long-term re in long-term recovery. I've had calls just in the last couple of weeks when we had the fire on the 4th of July with people panicked, absolutely panicked, six years later uh, about fire. And so everyone is different, reacts differently, and needs different resources. Uh, the recovery efforts, um, in terms of most impact, if you can get disaster case management up and functioning in two to six months, disaster case management is the key link, the umbilical cord to recovery. And so um, they also help with the navigation and understanding and access to resources that people that are in, uh, in stress situations in long-term recovery cannot maneuver. And so uh, it's really important uh, that they don't have, you know, they, I, we found out that our survivors had to go out and do 14 different applications of the same kind of thing for getting different resources. And uh, what you try and do is consolidate so that survivor energies are not uh, real strong. Also, our um, deliverables um, uh, and rely, you have, um, excuse me, reliable and trustworthy uh, delivery of resources. Uh, it's critical that if you offer something that it, that it happens. Um, also, uh, it's inclusive, holistic, and coordinated based on accurate data and needs and well vetted using uh, best practices and free of conflict of interest. So those are just some of the effective pieces, um, non-COVID that you usually do in long-term recovery. Um, disaster case managers, they went out to places and, and spent a lot of miles uh, going out and connecting with people. It will be a real challenge in the COVID era right now of how to do something in long-term recovery if we end up with a, another major impact. Um, just identifying personal impacts. Uh, for the 2015 clients surveyed three years uh, later, 
38% identified that they had uh, increased health issues that were directly related to the disaster, 38%. 6% passed away, and of those, 78.9% of the deceased, uh, through their families and friends, stated that the death was directly due to the disaster, the fire disasters. And so um, don't think that it's not impacting people. Uh, Long-term recovery is uh, highly um, impactful. Also, uh, disaster fatigue is compounding. And so we have had three FEMA declared disasters in six years here in Okanagan County. That, I've lived here for 40 years and never seen anything like this. And so we need to really understand the impacts of this. Uh, we have, I have story after story after story that can, I can tell you how impactful these things are. And with COVID adding into this, I, I struggle to see exactly how we're gonna handle this. I think that's a great segue, Carlene, and we're actually at time. Um, so what I'm gonna do next, if you'll get out of that share screen, I'm gonna invite you and Liz and Chris to answer the question of how uh, COVID-19 will impact our typical trajectory of recovery, either from smoke, um, long-term recovery, or recovery in terms of health and well-being. Um, Carlene, if you don't mind turning off your screen share. Yes. Thank you. I'm not sophisticated enough to do that as a host quite yet. No, I'm working on it here. Sorry. <laughs> um, great. Thank you. So the question is, um, how will COVID-19 um, affect our sort of typical trajectory of recovery from all of these different vantage points? Um, yeah. And anyone is welcome to start. Um, Chris, maybe we'll have you start first. I know you don't have a camera, um, but we'd yeah. love to have your reflections on that. I'm in the process of getting a camera just for these things. Uh, yeah, uh, wildfire smoke impacts our lives greatly, like um, Carlene said, and people um, have negative health impacts by breathing smoke at any level. And so our, our typical solutions for wildfire smoke uh, is to get people to go inside and shut their windows and doors and, and don't let and don't breathe the outside smoke. But as a slide show, I showed um, presented smoke gets into our and into our lives no matter what. So the recommendation is to, you know, go inside. Well, that doesn't work with COVID-19 because we want uh, lots of air inside your houses and a lot of circulation inside houses and buildings. And so that's, that's a counter measure there. Some of the other things um, wildfire smoke is we recommend people to filter their air inside their house, um, usually with a MERV 13 or a higher filter. It depends on if your AC units can take those or you can use a manufactured in-room unit or there's the do-it-yourself box fan filter, which we have a, a great video of that on our Colville Tribes air quality web page. So those may or may not help with COVID-19, but they sure will help with smoke. So mostly the at-risk community for wildfire smoke is 100% uh, overlap with the at-risk community for COVID-19. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, Liz, how about if we pass it over to you to answer that question of how you think COVID-19 will uh, affect communities this year in the context of- Yeah, and Chris and I had the opportunity to talk yesterday about this, so we're gonna sort of ping pong off each other here, but, um, so I'll just highlight that the Washington Department of Health did issue a COVID-19 and wildfire smoke guidance that lays out really nicely the typical public health recommendations for dealing with wildfire smoke and then how those are impacted by COVID-19 public health recommendations. And so it's very, very easy to sort of line that up. Chris touched on a few of them, but you know, one big thing is mask wearing. We've been working with people so hard to make sure they're wearing an N95 mask effort for real protection from PM 2.5 if they must be outdoors in heavy smoke um, and we're still making sure that we are preserving those masks for um, healthcare workers and other frontline workers and so even though I think probably people do have stashes set away here um, the recommendations formally are still for cloth mask wearing in the general public 
that's going to make it all the more important that those folks avoid exposures because they're not going to get much protection from smoke. Um, and as Chris said, that means that they're going to be inside. Our indoor air is not always um, any cleaner than the outdoor air or only marginally so. So, you know, for us, I think, again, it just highlights how important it is to empower people to either build um, box fan filters themselves. Uh, the Puget Sound Cleaner Agency has done extensive work and, and they've, they're actually quite confident that these inexpensive box fans do a pretty darn good job of cleaning indoor air. So um, that can be an accessible way for um, folks without the means to pick up a hundred or two hundred dollar standalone unit um, to to get some respite from um, from smoke inside their homes. Um, the other piece that you know I touched on in my presentation earlier is with regards to mental health, and I think it's undeniable that right now everyone is incredibly um, stressed. Everyone is already fragile and on the edge after four months of dealing with this pandemic. Um, they've been socially isolated. They are dealing with all again of those social determinants of health and worrying about economic stability. Um, and wildfire smoke is just going to layer on top of that. I've talked to so many people who have said that their primary line for dealing with their stress and anxiety around COVID has been to get outside, whether that's sitting on their front porch or you know going out horse packing or going deep into the mountains or anywhere in between. And if we bring back, you know, we have oppressive smoke conditions where folks literally can't be outside, feel trapped inside their hot homes. I think there's, you know, we really, really need to recognize the amount of outreach um, that's going to be necessary and the proactive communication that as healthcare providers, it's going to be necessary to take to really try to help people manage that stress. Um, and then the last one with COVID is just about access to care. Indeed if our um, numbers keep rising the way they do and our healthcare systems are strained, um, generally folks that need to seek treatment for either their mental health or for their welfare smoke exacerbated conditions, um, that may get even harder. Thank you, Liz. That's, yeah, that's all really, really helpful and important information. Um, Carlene, we'll pass it over to you. Yeah, so in terms of uh, folks that are uh, dealing with disaster and these fires up north uh, just this last week, uh, stay home and stay safe has a whole new meaning or a different meaning when you're in uh, evacuation three, level evacuation three mode. And uh, it's way more fearful uh, than it's ever been. People, uh, we had family members or uh, family folks up there that uh, evacuated who, did it late because they don't want to leave their home. They don't know where they're going. They don't know if it's safe to, for COVID uh, somewhere else. So they waited and delayed and uh, literally stalled out with children in the car, um, lost some of their home belongings and things. This is not going to be anything like we've seen um, this summer. And the fact that Washington or Oregon are the uh, highest strength uh, situations of, of likely fire danger in the nation, we, we need to figure out and be prepared for ways to support people that are in panic mode with COVID, um, leaving their homes uh, and needing support. So this is going to be a challenge um, for us what we've done uh, had for volunteers we've prepared for dealing with covid for volunteers that need to come in and support uh, long-term recovery efforts um, in the future and so we've got uh, we've got a thousand masks set aside uh, for those kind of volunteers and we've prepped uh, for for those kind of emergencies coming up um, but again, volunteers are not coming at this point. Uh, we had over 300 teams in the last five years with over 2,000 volunteer hours. And we, we have literally had five volunteers in the last two months uh, helping with, with finishing up our rebuild situation. So uh, it's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the questions I see in the chat box Carlene, is how might case management, uh, I specifically think disaster case management, help in preventing impact of wildfire and smoke 
crises? So uh, disaster case management uh, is, is the umbilical cord and the lifeline to survivors, people that need information right now and need correct and accurate information. And so agencies can filter and, and stream uh, resources to disaster case managers. We still have disaster case managers from 2014 working things right now, still. And we're just finishing up, our plan was to finish up by the end of the summer. Uh, at this point, we are going to extend those folks as potential resources in case we have some issues this summer. You know, we, I think, I think that everything you all have brought up is one, I think a great, great content to share with this particular audience who are healthcare providers, social service folks, healthcare administrators, hospital administrators, and I'm sure everyone is sort of queuing into the component that pertains to their relative area of work. And um, after this CHI meeting, Michelle and I will send out a survey to all of the CHI members and ask you all how you would like this conversation to continue and what would be most useful. So hearing either sort of a distillation from these three experts who are joining us today or whatever that might look like. Um, we are at time for today. I will say, uh, I just wanna say thank you so much, Liz, Chris, Carlene, truly. I mean, that you, the three of you live in Okanagan County is, is a gift to all of us. So thank you very much for bringing your expertise here. Thanks for having thank us. You.